Welcome, welcome. So um, this Saturday, we can, um, we're uh, have a garden tour of Sacramento Gardens. There's uh, Daisy Ma. Her personal garden is going to be on uh, tour. And then uh, we have three other gardens. One's right around the corner from hers, which is a postage stamp, amazing um, cottage garden. Uh, she was inspired by the BBC Gardener's World during the pandemic and transformed her whole yard to, or at least her backyard into a English garden, which is really great. And then our last garden is an eclectic artist and succulent garden. These two guys have uh, transformed this mid-century modern house that was yeah. evidently in really disparate pair and has redone the whole thing. And we're welcome to view all that I've done in the inside as well. The tour is from 10 o'clock in the morning at starting at Daisy's and bring something to um, share for a little coffee in the garden. And then we're going to have lunch in the last garden, which we'll, we'll get there about 1230. And then you're welcome to bring your own lunch, have lunch afterwards or order lunch, uh, sandwiches and sit and relax. And there's lots of things to do afterwards. Uh, William Lynn Park, we mentioned um, up if you want to go north about a half hour, Hyde Hand Nursery or the Horton uh, Iris Farm. You know, there's the Crocker Museum or you can go to UC Davis on the way home. And uh, there's a wonderful art museum there and or the uh, Arboretum is always fun to see as well. And then uh, coming up, Kristen's garden. Kristen has a really large garden in Danville. I guess it was the, the original land that the subdivision has uh, evolved around. That is on June 17th. Mark the date. I'd like to introduce Hadley Anak. And uh, she's the new owner of Western Hills Gardens. Hadley, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. I'm Hadley Dynak, and um, my husband, Kent Strader, and I are the newish owners of Western Hills Garden. I think we're going on 20 months or something like that. And I'm just, I met Anne at the last Bagnet meeting, Ann Anderson, and we got talking and she said, well, I think we have a spot for a speaker. Would you be interested in sharing? And I was like, well, I'm happy to share what I know. I'm sure a lot of people on this call know more than I do, but I would love to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about our vision and what we know about the property and get to know all of you. So here we are. So thank you. Here's just a couple Gorgeous photos of the property, our Japanese alcova, and, and a photograph of kind of the middle upper path last summer. And like what Mike just said, our rhododendrons are also in bloom and they're just phenomenal. It's just a great year um, all around. So as I'm assuming many people here know, Western Hills Garden was started in 1959 by Lester Hawkins and Marshall Ulbrich. It's a three acre property in Occidental, California, West Sonoma County. And it has a critically important collection of rare plants and trees from around the world because <laughs> Lester in particular liked to travel and, and bring specimens back. So it was always a nursery and which is why Ellen is calling it Western Hills Nursery and, and a lot of people still do, but also a specimen garden. So people could go out into the garden and look at the plants that were for sale in situ, um, if you will. And then each successive generation of ownership since, which we are the fifth owners of this property, has really influenced the direction and kind of built on the legacy that Lester and Marshall started. So I'll tell, talk a little bit more about the history for those that don't know in a minute, but because many of you know more about this this garden than we do. I'm going to paste um, something into the chat right now. I hope this works. There it is. So one of the things that we really think is important is understanding, you know, more and more about the legacy and the history as we think about the future. And so we created this little uh, Google form survey. It's a, it's just a tell your story survey um, with a few questions on it. And also um, opportunity to share ideas and suggestions and people that we should know if um, you can think of them. So take a second at some point, if you can, and look at that. And then any other questions that you've got, you know, feel free to jump in or put questions in the chat because Ellen said she could moderate that as well. So we purchased the garden in September of 2021. 
And we were not looking for West Sonoma property or anything remotely like Western Hills Garden, but we had long talked about the idea of owning property that could be a space for community connection, for friends and family to come together and appreciate food and art and music and a space for creative expression and contemplation and big thinking. So this garden kind of showed up in our lives. Um, we didn't really look for it. It uh, just arrived one day. And that's what we looked like when we decided um, to go for it. So that's the, the um, subject of the talk. When the universe offers you a historic garden, say yes. And yes, we, yes here we are, yes. Um, we are really overjoyed and definitely overwhelmed, but not in a terrible way and very optimistic about our future here. Let's see a little bit about us, more about us. I think before I say anything else, I should just humbly say that I am not a horticulturalist or a garden expert or a botanist or a landscape architect, um, but I'm definitely a garden enthusiast as is my husband. And we have fallen madly in love and are really honored to steward this um, property forward. We're relying on the huge community of support that's already come out um, and we're you know, looking to build more relationships as we go forward. And we invite you all to come up and explore and interpret what we've got here. My background is in public health. And so I'm really interested in kind of how the systems and ecologies that we operate in um, as people and as societies are interconnected with one another. And I think that the plant metaphor, everywhere you look on this property, there are examples of that, which is um, incredible. And I've served in a lot of different roles in my professional career, from running nonprofits to producing documentary films to raising funds for other nonprofits, largely social justice, not, not gardens. But I am primarily focused right now on leading the charge for um, operations and visioning and fundraising for Western Hills Garden because it's being run as a nonprofit for the first time in its 60 some year history. Um, which we're really excited about. We're fiscally sponsored right now by this really great organization on the Central Coast that focuses on ecological resilience and social justice and are in the process of applying for our own C3 status, which will open up opportunities for, for development and fundraising, um, which we hope will be lucrative. Okay, before I say much more, I have to also say plug this because I am also marketing a book that I just wrote, and that project came into my life at the same time that Western Hills Garden did. It's just a, a small uh, seven by seven, beautiful, giftable guidebook for a more equal, just, and joyful world. And I'm super excited about it and the connections that I'm making through that project and how they may influence um, the people that are, are coming to visit us. Um, so here's a little bit more of my family. This is Kent. He is a recovering uh, attorney. He still practices a little bit, but is very much excited about becoming a full-time plantsman. Um, he makes bouquets for everybody that comes to visit and is really keen on all the maintenance. So he's resurfaced a lot of the bridges to make them more safe um, and you know, is constantly projecting left and right. These are our daughters, uh, Stella and Simone. And Simone, who is on my right, maybe your right too, the one with the short hair, is a junior at Berkeley High School. So right now, until she graduates, we are splitting our time between Berkeley and Occidental, although one of us is here most of the time just because uh, we need to be. So um, she goes back and forth, but she also loves the garden. In fact, she works the kiosk and welcomes guests um, when we're open for visitors and um, talks a little bit about the garden as well. So if you come, you may meet her. And then Stella is our older daughter and she is a junior at UCLA and just surprised us for Mother's Day weekend, which was super fun. This, I have to show you these two things because you're getting to know all of us. And so this is our, our new pup on the left peeking out of the gate. Her name is Eloise. And she just is brand new in our lives because we lost Lily, who is on the right, who was our 14 year old rescue pup that we found on the street when the kids were little. And she got to experience Western Hills Garden and loved it. She passed away just a couple of months after we bought it. So we've renamed the big pond Lily Pond in her honor. 
and maybe this is too much insider information, but it's giving you a flavor of who we are, which is what I really wanted to do. This is a picture of the view from the property that financed the transaction for us to buy Western Hills Garden. So we were, we moved to the Bay Area from the Midwest. We're originally from Michigan and we had lived in, we were living in Chicago and decided to come westward in the late nineties. Um, and so we lived in the Bay Area, raised our kids, um, held a bunch of professional jobs, but my parents were living in Park City, Utah that whole time. So we decided at one point, gosh, now probably about 12 years ago to move there. And we bought a property on the top of a mountain. Then I ran the local arts council there, did a lot of public private partnership work to um, increase the value of arts in the area around tourism in particular. And we made a rash decision to move back to Bay Area to launch Stella from here so she could be in a more urban environment. And it opened up all the UCs and Cal States to her. So we kind of rushed back and moved into a rental and decided to rent the property in Utah with this outstanding view. Really, it's breathtaking, very different than Western Hills, but thousands and thousands of acres of open space in our backyard and trails. And we had two owner sale evictions. And so we finally decided that we needed to sell that property and figure out what we were going to do next. And while we were in contract on that property, a friend of ours from the Bay Area um, who knew you know, that we were going to have some capital or sent us the listing for Western Hills Garden. And our realtor was a Sotheby's realtor, as was this property listed under. So, you know, they made a call and we had a conversation. And my husband said, I think I want to go live in this octagon house. And I said, well, maybe you should go live in the octagon house, Mr. Lawyer, that doesn't know really what he wants to be doing next. And then I looked at the property and we both were kind of blown away. So about a week later, we saw it. And about two weeks after that, we were in contract on it. So it was a really fast decision and one that we do not yet regret. And I don't think that we will. So here we are. So this is the slide I was supposed to show you while I was talking about when the property came into our lives. So this is, this is what it looked like uh, when we first came to see it. This is the first snap that, that we took. And so now a little bit more about um, the history. We really loved the property. In fact, I think my husband only made it around a couple of quarters and just looked at the realtor and said, we want to put in an offer. I was kind of like, are you sure? Like, this is a lot of work. <laughs> what are we going to do? But he said, yes. And so um, then we started to really dig into the legacy. And that is what sold us because I just think the property and its history and the people that started it, all the people that have influenced it and touched it um, is really a special, special thing and something that we are really committed to with um, our work here. And so here are a couple of pictures from the way, way back. This is Lester on the steps of the big porch. And then a little bit about what things looked like in the in the early days. It, the, the photo says it's newly planted landscape. So I am going to go with that. But I think it must have been really, really early days because it's hard to see all of the runnels. One of the things that I think was most brilliant, and there were many, 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 but the thing that we've seen in action was their decision to build these trenches kind of as a starting point to move water through the property during rainy season and some holding ponds in between. And then they built the paths, which are, um, you know, kind of winding with bridges every so often. So you could cross the runnel in different ways and then plant it around that. And it really has um, today created not only an incredible uh, architectural feature, but also it still holds up. I mean, with the 77 inches of rain that we got this year, there was very little puddling on the property. Um, so the runnels continue to do their job. Um, it's my understanding they got the property in 1959 for $2,300, which um, was an inheritance that Marshall had received. And it had no real experience with horticulture or gardening um, or homesteading. So we take great relief in that. Although uh, today we have all these incredible visitors that come to visit us. And today, Stu Winchester um, from Merritt College came and spent a long time um, on the property. It was so interesting to talk to him and can't wait to get him back. But he was he was sharing kind of some of his experiences. It was cool to, to meet him. Um, and he was also saying that 
you know, they really had this foresight of thinking about plants from all over the world and how they would fit together in an environment that was was a similar climate, a Mediterranean climate as some of these other places across the world. And he was also talking about color, which I had not heard before and how his understanding was that that Lester and Marshall were, were really um, on the forefront of thinking about plants using different colors than what were typically here. So like a formium that you know, was this bright chartreuse color or um, had a variegation in it that, that hadn't been seen here before. So that was really interesting, super curious to hear uh, other people's thoughts about, about their influence on that. So then Maggie Witch um, got the property. She was bequeathed the property from Lester and Marshall and did a lot of her own um, improvements on the property. She had the Runnels stone. This is a picture from not this year, but the year before actually, and how the water rushes through these runnels. Um, but now they're just this beautiful architectural feature. And then of course, she also um, had this folly designed and built based on a design from Penelope Hobhouse, I believe. She didn't live on the property though. And I think a lot of the buildings fell into neglect from again, what I've heard. So she, after 17 years, I believe owned the property, um, got to a point where friends and family were suggesting that she sell it. And so she did. This is actually not what it looked like when she sold it, but she sold it to two guys that um, owned it for a short period of time, bought high, didn't have the resources to maintain it. Um, and despite the help of the Garden Conservancy and Betsy Flack and Antonio Adizio, who have recently come into our lives, which we're so grateful for, and Susan Howard, who some of you may know, she lived on the property for three months and cataloged all of the plants and trees and assets and showed up early days when we had first bought the property with a little flash drive that felt like a gold treasure. I was so excited to get that. Um, so we're collecting things as we go along, but the guys lost it. And Chris and Tim Sabalski, who are the owners that we purchased from, put a ton of heart and soul and money into the place. Um, really, you know, tons and tons of debris removed. They rebuilt the, the many of the facilities. This is a picture of what the main house looks like now, if you haven't been here in a while. Um, and it's hard to see, but if you kind of look toward the end, there the one part of the structure that's still the same, which we call the chapel, is on the far right side past the, the furthest porch. And the stained glass is still there and all of the the redwood paneling that was original to the house, as well as the adobe wall, which runs the length of the house and, and still keeps the house very cool even when it's hot, which is amazing. They also put in this commons area, which used to be a lot of nursery beds um, for plants for sale. Uh, and it is really an incredible asset in terms of the opportunity to offer the space for the public to gather, um, not necessarily for big events, but for just stopping and you know chatting with a friend as they're walking around the property or um, having a bite to eat, you know, and a picnic that they bring or something. And where some of our public programming that we've started is happening. Okay, um, maybe thumbs up, thumbs down. Too much detail. Is this this is okay? Um, thumbs up couple thumbs up. Okay, good. Yay. Okay. That's the Chris and Tim era. And I do have to say like, there would have been no way that my husband and I could have stepped into this without the work that they had done. Um, because we are jumping in and, and just kind of, you know, drinking from the fire hose, learning, 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 and the house is beautiful. And, you know, the spaces is, is much improved. So everything we're doing is kind of layering onto um, what everyone um, so far of the ownership has done and all of the people that have invested time into it so far. Okay, so now let's see, Western Hills Garden today. We have come full circle. Um, here's some more eye candy for you, pictures that have been taken in the last couple years. For those who have not been here, Western Hills Garden has five ponds. This is the picture of the big pond uh, that's now Lily's Pond. It has 34 bridges that go across these runnels that I was talking about, the folly, which I already showed you. Um, and then like endless numbers. I, I should have all of the data about all of the plants and, and I have to just apologize and say, I don't, I'm still learning, but thousands of specimens, very rare trees. We have lots of uh, conifers from all over the place, two Willemi pines, 
camellia forest. I think there's like 30 or 40 different kinds of camellias. And we, we just found a new grove at the bottom of the garden that we kind of extracted from a bunch of things that was grow were growing around them. Um, and those really bloomed well this year because of that TLC, endangered Chinese maples, dozens and dozens of ferns, and of course, perennial shrubs, as far as you can see. So really important specimens and plant history. Here's a little bit more of the infrastructure. This is the prop house. It still uh, is um, funky, but we love it and is, is working just fine to propagate a few things. It's not going to be you know, our primary focus is on nursery sales. We will have some, we had some that um, plants that we inherited from Chris and Tim, and we've continued to propagate things that exist in the garden. I don't think that we will be, you know, a retail nursery where we'll, we'll buy plants from others. Although we do have a wholesaler's license. The octagon has been a little bit updated and is a lovely guest house for some of our visiting artists that have been coming through and others. And the glass house is in the bottom in the middle. And that is right now mostly um, begonias and a few rare ferns. And the begonias, to be honest, I had never seen begonias like that. I had begonias in my life that my grandmother had in like a little tiny row that were about three inches high all around her front house. And these, you know, they look like orchids. They're so, they're so stunning. What else? We inherited two garden cats. This is Squeaky, the one that's up in the corner, yawning. There's our Walemi pine, another one of the ponds. Gorgeous Grevillea. This Grevillea is stunning with its bright orange tips. We have another one that's purple with green tips. Um, that's just fantastic. Many, many frogs and birds. My husband actually this morning was like, we need to have a a morning where we're opening at like six, where people can come and just listen to the birds because they're really most active in the morning, which is incredible. All right. So that's, that's a little bit about where we are today. Oh, no, we're not. We got some more here. So this is the team that, that really helps us. Howell has been with the property for, I think, 15 years now. And um, he knows every inch of the irrigation. He knows everything about the ponds. Um, he's an incredible incredible asset. And then Mary Zovich, who um, is in the um, dry border bed, we call it, is our new collections manager. Neither one of them work full time. Our budget, it fluctuates, um, but like 125. And so we have enough runway for a few years, but we're definitely getting into fundraising mode so that we have enough, not only to support the existing staff that we have and to grow it, but to you know think about things a little more professionalized than to part-time gardeners working in this space. We also have, and it's just incredible, a whole crew of volunteers that preceded us and that know the property and have served as docents. Dick Miner is a retired microbiologist. He's, maybe some of you know him, he comes on Tuesdays and chips and makes compost. And uh, we have propagation team and um, these guys are really just, just incredible. And new volunteers have been coming, which is fun too, to be onboarding new people. This is the white whale, we call it the white eucalyptus. And this is on the far right, the weeping katsura and the, the Japanese maple above Lester's Pond. And there's another picture of the Willem. We had a lot of storm damage, which I thought you guys might be interested in seeing. And it was pretty shocking, especially for us, but we also it was great for us to just learn to be zen about the the impact and forces of nature uh, and the opportunities that change brings. So we lost the Serbian spruce, which um, was leaning over the pond already. It fell into the pond. So that was nice because it didn't hurt anything else, but it was a giant project to remove it. This, these are the tree guys that came out. They had to get into that white boat that I showed you earlier to try to cut it up. And some of it's still there because um, I think they went through two chainsaws with them getting, you know, backed up with water and things, but that was a big project. And then we also lost the hundred foot tall golden weeping cypress, which was really sad because that tree was just spectacular. And both the trees, both the Serbian spruce and this one, as you can see here, pulled up you know, they just flopped over and their root balls just came up. So that impacted the paths and the irrigation around them. And so not only 
or you know their um, the issues of just getting them removed, but also all of the repair work to repair the areas around them. This area now, uh, which is right above the Chilean wine palm, which you can see behind it in this picture, is a completely different ecosystem now. It used to be um, very shady and lots of ferns and, and palms. And so we've moved a lot of the ferns that were now getting direct sun and kind of giving a little negative space to that area and seeing what's gonna happen next. We did have though um, another golden weeping cypress that's probably, I don't know, maybe five years old, four years old that was on the property that we moved. So it's now sitting next to this one. So it, it, there is, there's a, a succession plan, um, if you will. The nice thing about this is it opens up the view to this coral tree that we have that is just spectacular. So you can really see that now. So I guess that's the point, right? You get to see change happen and, and look for the silver linings when you can. Moving forward, this is kind of a little bit of our, our vision phase, which this is our fairy ring right outside the octagon is pretty big and kind of high in the sky, but I think also, um, you know, it has lots of little steps along the way. We really know we have big shows to fill, both with respect to the horticultural legacy of this place, as well as the stewardship to keep it as magical as possible with the constraints of the world that we're living in. Um, but we believe in the power of big possibilities and, and, and really the idea that I think is becoming more and more talked about is the importance of nature for mental health, particularly after the pandemic, where people you know, needed to get outside to reconnect to each other and, and something outside of their house. So I think given the existential climate crisis that we're in, there's a lot of opportunity to use this space to help people understand the power of nature in healing and in moving a collective consciousness together, you know, this whole idea of fungal networks and trees from all over the world, you know, whatever you think about all of that, I think that, that the metaphor of that is really, really important and something we want to shepherd forward um, because the environment itself, as we all know, has so much to teach us. So our vision, this is our working vision mission statement, is about linking plants, place, and people with the idea of possibility, both for themselves as individuals, but also possibility in a much bigger way. And we want to, again, these are very big aspirational ideas, but I think we need to have something to always work toward really thinking about inspiring hope and catalyzing creativity and looking for opportunities for ideas to take root across, um, across lots of different issues so that the garden is not only a place of horticultural significance, but it's also a place of learning and creative expression and interconnection and connection with others. And so we're going to do that in three ways. Again, this is all very um, early stage because we're only 20 months in, but preservation is our number one priority. And that's thinking about, well, I'll go through it. So the, the preservation programming and partnerships. And then there's a, a lovely story about this bench that arrived in our lives after we had purchased the property. We got this wonderful email and uh, the, the header was, or the subject line was, I think we have something you want. So, well, that's interesting. So then you follow up and um, this is a bench that Maggie had given to a friend of hers before the property was sold to Joseph and Joseph and Frank, Robert, Robert and Joseph. And she just wanted it to be um, held by some people that she really cared about. And so they, they held it this entire time and then reached out after they had heard a little bit about us and what we were doing and returned it. And it's very hard to see, but there's an M and an L with a little fleur-de-lis that's been engraved on the top of it, which um, is cool. So it's now sitting right next to the folly when people come in. So here's a little bit about the preservation thinking, obviously honoring the legacy, as I've said um, lots of times already, but thinking about it with an eye toward the realities of the climate and water and sustainability. So what I didn't, we, you know, there's a lot that that means, and we're still unpacking what that looks like for us. But I think some of the, the basic things are, we have a new natives mound. We needed to replant an area over by the pond. We had some smoke bush and some formium that we're not doing so well. And 
So we um, we planted natives there so that it doesn't require any water and it, it, it works because we're moving down that's into the kind of summer dry bed in the perennial garden. We're not using any chemical fertilizers or pesticides, which is uh, a newer thing, at least um, for the last, the previous ownership. Um, things like, you know, compost tea and polar spray and working with Dick to make the, the right kind of compost, um, using leaf mulch, um, looking at getting new controllers so we have better, you know, more fine tuning of the irrigation systems that we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, and that kind of thing. So, so those are all initial ideas with um, lots more to come. And then I had the, the great pleasure of recently being in the Portland area. And so I went out and visited uh, Sean Hogan and um, he has had a really big influence on this property. A lot of the plants have come from his nursery, Sistus Nursery. I mean, I don't know about a lot, but a decent number. Um, we always look at things that are very rare and say, oh, I think that was a Cystus purchase. He also was the one who designed that, that uh, commons area. So he um, was you know, sharing stories and we were talking about um, the future and discussing the importance of having a collections policy. So that is um, something that we really are gonna work on um, in the near term is what decisions we need to make about the future of the collection, what the replacement policy is, the best way you know, to steward the garden forward given climate, um, what our, like Stu today was talking about, you know, are you a historic garden or maybe Lester and Marshall would be pushing the field forward. So maybe you wanna be thinking about, you know, what new kinds of plants you should be, you should be bringing in. So these are all really important questions that, that we you know, are gonna take very seriously. And, and it, to that end, convene a horticultural advisory board to help us um, make those decisions because um, you know we don't we don't profess to have any level of expertise on that. So we want to bring in folks that um, can help us. And then, like I said before, too, also in the process of fundraising, and we're starting with a preservation fund that will give us a longer runway and some more resources for that work. So, so that was preservation. This is, this is programming. And, and again, we're starting really small. Um, we have been open for day visitors since for about a year now, actually on the weekends, we started with just a couple weekends a month, because again, we're going back and forth and have a teenage daughter who has her own life and loves it up here, but can't be up here all the time. So now we're moving into almost every weekend and hopefully this summer we will actually hire somebody that can be working the kiosk and not have it be us. And that way then um, we can have more stable hours. But we've also done a lot of tours, which is really fun. The volunteers are um, trained docents. We inherited a docent manual, which we've updated and you know needs more, more work, but we're, we're excited to be able to, to share the space through guided tours. Um, in fact, we've got a guided tour this weekend with the California Landscape Garden Historical Society, who's also visiting Mike's place. So that's awesome. We're gonna do this sister nursery thing um, here and there um, up at Hidden Forest. So we're excited about that partnership. And then we've expanded the community programming. Just recently, we're piloting a series of public programs. They'll have three different tracks. One is creative programming, and you can see a couple of the um, pieces from, from uh, Mary Delaney, botanical collage class on the left. And then on the far right, we did mark making with natural objects where people went around the garden and picked up, you know, stones or twigs or seed pods and used them to make marks um, that were representative of what they were seeing in the garden it was super fun. Um, and the tour in the middle is actually a, a tour from the single thread farms folks and they're a, a three-star Michelin restaurant in Healdsburg that had heard about the property and they came in and took a tour and then we got to go to their property and see what they're up to. So just the, the possibility of programming with people that we're meeting over time is really exciting. We're also considering, but haven't really put any effort into yet, uh, some kind of elementary education field experience. And we definitely would like to serve as a very small residency space for, you know, artists and, and writers and others that are thinking about um, the future of the climate and writing and, and working on those issues um, for short term stays. So that's exciting. But that's also um, early days, although we do invite the artists that are coming to teach these classes or the instructors to stay in the guest house. So it's a mini 
mini weekend residency for them to get to be in the garden and wake up and teach the class here, um, you know, after being immersed in the space. And then the third area of focus is partnerships. And this, I was running out of time and putting this slideshow together. So I only has a few on here, but there'll be a lot more. We, we committed, um, we're really excited about being a member of the American Public Garden Association. Uh, and I'm, I just, I can't say enough about how generous the, the garden community is and, and you know all the people that I've met so far. I mean, even the fact that we're here right now is something that I've not seen in my, my, my professional career so far, that a group of, of people are so committed to supporting each other. When, when the trees fell this winter, we put out a call on the Public Garden Association listserv and people were calling from all over the country with ideas and thoughts and it was just really um, helpful and wonderful. And then Sonoma State, we just started an internship program with them. So we're going to continue working with them. Merritt College is another um, internship program that we're building. And we actually are going to have somebody who's studying to be a climbing arborist come and work with us this summer, which is going to be great because even at just like a bare minimum, the trees need, you know, have ivy growing up or, or they have mulch around them. So we need to clear out the base of all of them and really do a better job of assessing kind of the health and maturity of the collection so we can understand how to prevent and react moving forward. And the Bay Area Garden Network um, I mentioned before and, and Mike and, and um, I are starting to talk about partnerships and schools and nonprofits. And, you know, we're really thinking that, that we would like to um, build the community of people that use the space in ways that are aligned with the vision. And that's the red bud, the baby red bud uh, that is blooming that my husband sent to me, which was a very sweet gesture, but it really reflects how we all feel about this property. So um, that is what I've got to say. I think maybe just in closing, and then we can you know, tell stories or ask questions and talk is that we really do need people to, you know, follow and share and come visit and give us ideas because that's the only way we're going to be able to sustain this process right now. We're kind of moving forward all speeds ahead, but um, it takes, it takes a community to build a community. So thank you for having me and inviting me into your community. Thank you, Hadley. You're my hero. That's, that's great that you, you and your family have taken this on and uh, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of support and we all support you as well. Does anybody have any questions for Hadley or uh, stories about Western Hills that they want to share? Uh, Hadley, I'm so glad that you got this place. That your vision is so aligned with my thinking. And um, I, I've been a fan of Western Hills ever since I got to California with Cal Hort Society and things like that. And I'm really looking forward to the partnership. I think it's really important, you know, you know, connecting to nature it, it is radically necessary at this time. So, and, you know, I love the title of your talk because it happened to me too. And I said, yes, thank you. Uh, being a hero and trying to save uh, Sonoma Hort Garden there. And we still have to come visit that one too, for sure. Yes, please. And you can come individually as well. Well, that's true too. Thursday through Monday, nine to four. Okay, yeah, uh, encourage everybody to go visit. Any other uh, questions or, like I said, stories? She must hear a little bit of uh, history of uh, you guys' experience from Western Hills. Or I would just be interested in knowing how many people on the call have been here before. I don't know if there's like a way to, to yeah, raise hands. Yeah. I can't right. count these. <laughs> no, that's good. It's it's really great to see the hands raising up. Oh my gosh. I've never been there and I hope to go there soon, but I just want to say how exciting it is to hear your story and your vision. And it's just all really exciting. Like I feel invigorated hearing about it and I hope that I, yeah, come meet you in person one day and, you know, play in the garden and, and make some memories. Cause yeah, it's all just really, really exciting. So Keep up the good work. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And and we are, you know, trying to build out programming. So um, if there are things that you are you specialize in or or have a thought of the kind of thing that would be good to be offering here that you would be interested in or you think other people um, you know, in your network would be interested in, we would love to hear that. 
so that we can be not just making up our own ideas, but you know, being responsive to what folks want to experience. Yeah, I love the idea of the the music and the uh, um, arts uh, filtering into the garden as well. I think that's great, great combo. <laughs> I would just like to say that uh, almost my entire life in horticulture has been in California, which makes it since 1987. And uh, Western Hills was always a Mecca for me and so many people that I knew. And I even got to meet uh, Lester and, um, well, I'm Don't really bad at names. Marshall. Marshall. Yeah, yeah. I got to know them. I, I don't know if you are aware that Ginny Hunt was with Maggie initially. She was part of that group for a while. You know, I have heard that name, but I don't know much about her. So I, that's, that's... She, she worked at uh, Suncrest Nursery later on. I think she and Maggie actually had a falling out, but she has an amazing garden down in Watsonville. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she would be happy to talk to you about her perspective. Yeah, she's quite an amazing plants woman, has an amazing collection herself. Nothing like Western Hills, but she has, she did seed hunt for a long time, which she um, sold seeds. I don't know if she still does it, mm -hmm. but she had all these unusual and rare seeds that she sold in addition to her job at, at um, Suncrest. Unfortunately, Suncrest is closing, which all of that always makes me sad to say the least, but this makes me happy that you're doing. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kristen. And I would say um, Seed Hunt is still going and she actually owns the property across the street from you. Ginny Hunt does? Oh, you know what? I did yes, hear that. She's she got does. renters in there right now, I think. So I yes. have not met her, but yeah, I met the people that are living in the house. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. That's a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for reminding me of that. Somebody mentioned that at one point. I forgot. Any other questions? Comments? Well, um, I want to encourage everybody to take the survey that Hadley posted on the chat earlier uh, in regards to how people see Western uh, Hills and uh, what you'd like to see with the garden. If you have any time and, and thoughts, please share them because that's critical to us to be thinking about, like I said, what, what we want to do moving forward. So thank you for having me again. And it's wonderful to meet all of you. Look forward to yeah, I'm so glad that you ran into Anne. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for. Uh, oh my gosh, it was it was amazing to go to that meeting. I mean, it's just another example of how wonderful this community is. I met so many good people, and uh, they were sharing stories of their storm damage, and really were validating because we were like, "What did we do wrong? Were we watering the wrong way?" And they were just really reassuring that sometimes these things, you know, with 77 inches of rain after three years of drought, happen, especially yeah. when trees. Um, are nearing the end of their lives or have some other kind of problem going on. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Hadley. We're, we'll be up to see you very soon. Yes, please do. <laughs> and thank you guys. Okay. Thanks so Bye. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Hadley. Bye -bye. Bye. So next month we have Paul Bonine and he is, um, he was going to speak with us in February and then he had to have emergency oral surgery or something there. So Anyway, we're gonna, he's going to be speaking about the heat dome that they had last summer and how it affected the uh, natives and what survived and did well and what didn't. And they probably can uh, tell us how they're um, coming back as well. Yeah, well, and uh, I think they're experiencing another major heat wave right now. And Paul does a lot with weather. He's also one of the co-owners of Zira Nursery. Um, which is a, a specialty grower in the Portland area. All kinds of unusual plants, but a lot of unusual natives. Ooh. And that Paul actually has made quite a few selections out in the wild that I'm actually growing some of them here at my house and, we're, and I'm propagating some of them for some of our plant sales in the future. One is called, what is it? Uh, Zira's Lime Punch Ribes and if you know Ribe's Brockle Bankii, that kind of golden foliage one that tends to be a wheat grower, this is similar except the leaves are bigger and a lot more substance. I'm very impressed with it. Red flowers, but again, the flowers happen 
pretty much as the leaves are just starting to come out. So it's not a weird contrast. Pink flowers? Uh, reddish, reddish pink. It's a, it's a ribe sanguinium sanguinium. Mm, okay, okay. Anyway, so this is going to be um, two days after we visit Kristen's garden. So you'll get information on well, both of those. And then we have two board, new board members, Heather, who wonderfully identified the Aurelia, and then Carolyn, Carolyn McNiven. So welcome to those guys. And thank you so much for coming forward. And then also Jane uh, Freeman, who came to our last board meeting, and she's uh, willing to help out as well. So that's wonderful to have that added support for everybody. And then our next board meeting, we'll send out an invite to everybody, if uh, whoever wants to partake and give suggestions and uh, ideas. We're all open to that. Anybody so, else have any other announcements or anything? I just wanted to also um, reiterate, I've talked to Ellen about it, but I'm hoping to host a, a potluck weekend meeting for all current, future, and past uh, <laughs> board members and officers um, of Cal Hort, just to give us all a chance to encourage everybody who's stepping into those roles now. So um, I ideally I would do it by like mid late June, but it sounds like we have so many things on the calendar now. I'll just be looking for an opportunity uh, wherever it fits. <laughs> Thank you. Mark, you're amazing. You really are. You've always been amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, with no further ado, thanks everybody for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.